Such a nice buzz here tonight. Hello and welcome. I'm Luis Jaramillo, the director of the Graduate Writing Program. And we're so happy to welcome back our friends from the Story Prize. Julie Lindsay, the founder of the Story Prize, and Larry Dark, the director, are great champions of the short story, and thank goodness. If the novel and poem ran off together and then had a brilliant but nonconformist child, that would be the short story. <laughs> Those of us here know that the short story deserves all the attention it can get. And so how lucky we are tonight to hear from the finalists for the Story Prize. I'd like to thank Lori Lynn Turner, Gregory Collins, Dimitri Raftopoulos, Paul Flores, and Sylvan Simon for their help tonight. And then without further ado, the host and in interviewer for this evening will be the dashing and eloquent Larry Dark, the director of the Story Prize. Please welcome Larry to the stage. <laughs> I'm not sure I can live up to that. I'm gonna try and manage expectations down a little bit. I think. Uh, thank you, Luis, and thanks to the New School. This is our 10th year here, and uh, I don't think we could ask for a better place to hold this event. It's one of the best venues in New York for, for literary events. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank Lori and uh, Pam also, who have been with us the whole 10 years, I think. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Chisholm Foundation for backing the prize. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. And I believe short story collections deserve and need an award of their own. We're here to honor three outstanding books that Julie Lindsay and I chose as finalists from among a record 129 entries from 85 different publishers or imprints. Half of those imprints are probably from Penguin Random House. Who, is, who accounts for all three finalists tonight. Um, and our finalists are, as you know, Frances Francesca Marciano for The Other Language, Elizabeth McCracken for Thunderstruck, and Lori Moore for Bark. Three judges. <laughs> three judges read the books we chose as finalists, and they chose the winner. They were a bookseller, Arsen Kashkashian, director of the Center for Fiction, Noreen Tomasi, and author, Laura Vandenberg. We're pleased that Noreen and Laura were able to join us tonight for the event. Also with us tonight is author Kyle Miner, who's the winner of the Story Prize Spotlight Award for his book, Praying Drunk. This is an award we added a couple of years ago because we found that among the books we read each year are some compelling com collections that we want to especially call attention to. A can't miss book or the work of an author to watch. And both of those are true of Praying Drunk. Kyle, would you please stand? Oh, there he is. Signed copies of Kyle's book and those by Francesca Marciano, Elizabeth McCracken, and Lori Moore are available from bookseller McNally Jackson at a table just outside the doors to the auditorium. So here's how the reading will go. I think some of you have been here before. Each author will read and then discuss her work with me. I get to say her this year. I don't have to say his or her. <laughs> After the final author, Lori Moore, reads, the founder of the Story Prize, Julie Lindsay, will announce the winner. But until then, our aim is to present three exceptional books by three talented authors in the best possible light to convey to those of you who haven't yet read them the excellence of the collections and the stories they contain. Everybody starts with a blank page, but few fill that space as skillfully as these authors do. I will introduce each of them before they read. Um, fortunately, we've included their biographies in the program, so I don't have to list all of their incredible accomplishments. You can read that for yourself. So my introductions will focus on the books they've given us rather than past accomplishments. Uh, I want to thank Kristen Radke, a talented graphic essayist who created the cover images for us for the program as a piece of original art, and the program designer, Stephen Charney. So let's begin. 
Our first author is Francesca Marciano. Her collection, The Other Language, was a revelation to us. These superbly crafted stories are set in locales that include Greece, Rome, Venice, an island off the coast of Africa, India, uh, Kenya, southern Italy, and New York. In fact, the protagonist of one of the stories set partly in New York takes classes right here at the New School. But such locales are not merely backdrops. All play essential roles, inexorably altering the orbits of the characters who visit or inhabit them. I'm pleased to introduce Francesca Marciano. Hello. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'll just read from the first story of the book. It's called The Other Language. Um, just a couple of lines to tell you where, we're, where we are. We're in Greece in the 70s. Uh, a young father has taken his three children on holiday for the first time outside Italy because their mother has just died in a strange accident hoping to distract them from what has happened. And the oldest of the children, Emma, has developed a crush on two English boys, but unfortunately she cannot talk to them because she doesn't speak English. So the next summer they come back and Emma has been anxiously waiting to see the boys again. Then one early morning, Emma looked up from her yogurt and honey and there they were, the English boys, back on the jetty in their canvas shorts, sitting low on the hips, slipping on flippers, ready to dive in. They too had grown up since the previous summer in that shocking Alice in Wonderland way that happens between the age of 12 and 15. They were much taller, sturdier, and their hair had reached their shoulders. She followed the trajectory of their arms and fins breaking the stillness of the water like two dolphins behind a boat till they reached the shore of the island and turned into two tiny vertical figurines jumping from rock to rock, just like the goats. What are you looking at? The father asked. Nothing, she said, smiling at him. He was such a handsome man, her father, still so young and lanky, his sandy hair falling across his face. He wore a white shirt with a threadbare collar over what he called his Bermuda shorts the sleeves rolled up to his elbow. No wonder women fell in love with him. He was so quiet, and by then she could tell from his enduring silences, so lonely. Emma doesn't remember, Emma doesn't remember now how the magic happened. Who said what first, which words were exchanged. All she knows is that the memories of that summer turned into English because that's what she found herself speaking. It was like an infant going from blabber to complete sentences in just a few weeks, letting the brain do the job in its mysterious way. It came like a flow, an instantaneous metamorphosis she was completely unaware of. All she remembers is that one summer, the younger boy was speaking incomprehensible words, and then the next, Thanks to the Beatles, to Johnny Mitchell's lyrics, to the promise of love, the same clipped syllables turned into verbs that described actions, adjectives that specified attributes, and nouns she now grasped as if in her hands and succeeded in using them all, ordering them in the right sequence to make herself understood. That summer forever marked the moment when she swam all the way to the island and landed in a place where she could be different from whom she assumed she was. There were so many possibilities. She didn't know what she was getting away from, but the other language was the boat she fled on. It turned out that Jack and David longed for company too, and an Italian girl their age was probably an equally exotic novelty for them. David, the older one of the two, had deep blue eyes, lighter hair, and the look of a melancholic troubadour. 
He told her she should listen to the Rolling Stones instead of the Beatles and twisted his lips when she quoted from Blue. He asked her whether she liked Pink Floyd, The Doors, Frank Zappa, or Led Zeppelin, and Emma nodded but didn't make any specific comment, nor wanting to reveal what a beginner she was in terms of rock bands. Jack, the dark-haired one who had spoken to her the previous summer in Castraki, seemed in awe of his older brother and waited for him to end the interrogation, nodding from time to time. When David was finished, Jack stepped forward and without any preamble asked her whether she'd like to follow them home for tea. Inside the villa, things were scattered all over the place without logic, as if by a tornado. The kitchen table was covered with breakfast leftovers, potted plants, gardening utensils, masks and flippers, wet swimsuits, baskets filled with tomatoes and onions and stale bread, piles of magazines and newspapers. On the floor there were tools, the wheel of a bicycle, a huge carton concealing a mysterious appliance. An English pop song blared cheesily from the, a small stereo and a diffused smell of burnt garlic hovered in the air. The boy's mother walked into the kitchen barefoot and braless, wrapped in a floral tunic. She had a pyramid of frizzy hair, a shining halo of gold. She stroked Jack's curls, introduced herself as Penny, and asked Emma whether she was going to join the boys for tea. Peter, come lo meet lovely Emma, she sang to her husband. A balding man in, with a paunch and a deep tan, intent on digging a hole in the backyard, waved his hand with a musical, hello there. Emma was impressed by their ease. Nobody seemed to mind or even notice the mayhem, as if this was simply their habitual standard of life. The boys took Emma to the room, more clothes and wet towels rolled up on the floor, and put a Frank Zappa LP on a small record player, full blast, overpowering their parents' music from the next room. They made Emma listen in religious silence, scanning her face for a reaction. David laughed when she said she wanted to learn how to play the guitar. Why you laugh, she asked. David blurted out something unintelligible. Because you said guitar, Jack repeated for her, slowing down the words. It's guitar, try. David said. She tried a few times, wishing she had never pronounced that word, the feeling of those ungovernable sounds sliding and slushing out of control between palate, teeth, and tongue embarrassed her. I can't, she pleaded. It's okay, David said. I like your Italian accent. His remark displeased her because she had no idea she had an accent and figured it probably make her sound, made her sound stupid. It's very cool, actually, Jack added with sudden fervor and smiled at her. Emma blushed, unprepared as she was to receive a compliment from him. Then Penny called from the kitchen in a soprano voice and made room on the table for a teapot, toast and butter. Emma looked at a, small, at a, at a small round jar filled with a dark brown, sticky looking substance. What is this? You don't know Marmite? Jack asked, incredulous. Penny turned from the sink where she was busy washing something. Jack, darling, Marmite is a British peculiarity mostly ignored by the rest of the world. She came to the table and swiftly spread butter and the brown sticky stuff on a piece of burnt toast. She handed it to Emma. Here, my love, try your first Marmite sandwich and make a wish. Emma bit into, into it with her eyes closed. The taste was so different from anything she'd ever tried before. The sticky, salty substance married the bitter taste of black tea deliciously. She made her wish. If Peter died of a sudden heart attack, then her father could marry Penny, and their life would be filled with pop songs in the kitchen, <laughs> colorful hippie clothes, marmite sandwiches, and more words in English. Thank you. Technical difficulties. Right. Uh, I think I have to ask this because of the story you chose to read in the title. You are an Italian, you speak Italian, and you wrote in English. Yes. How did that come about? <laughs> How did that happen? Well, um, yeah, I was born and raised in Italy, and I didn't speak English for the first 13 years of my life. 
which I think was the inspiration of this first novel, because in a way I kind of had a, I, a sort of a coup de foudre with the language when I was a, a teenager. And I think you do learn a language when you have a reason for it. And um, maybe it was a vocation, I don't know, but I, I started speaking when I was a teenager, and uh, that somehow changed my life. In fact, the inscription in my, of my book is a Derek Walcott phrase that says, in order to change your language, you have to change your life. Mm -hmm. And were your circumstances similar to the character in the story? I, I, I hate to yeah. force an identity of the author on the story, uh, but. Of course, yes and no, as usual. You know, there, there were things. We did go to Greece, let's put it that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> English boys? In the background. <laughs> um, so. OK. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well, one, you know, you have to fish right, right. with the material that you've accumulated. Yeah. So. And was this the first story you wrote in this book? Was, yes. Did you have the idea of this as a theme for the book or just as a frame for it, maybe? I did think about this story for a long time. I never Sorry. wrote it, but um, I, OK, let me tell you. I, this is uh, the first time that I'm, I wrote some short stories, and mm. I decided to do it. Um, I love the form. And this one, this particular short story was the first that I thought of writing, and the others came after. And somehow they were all in my, they had been in my head for a long time, except I never got down to write them. And uh, it was very surprising how they all came to me one after the other. Mm. So I also f realized what an incredible form, you know, and what an incredible opportunity for a writer to write a short story, to have the advantage of, of working on a sort of a smaller plane. Mm -hmm. Like an, I, I thought some, one day I thought maybe it's a little bit like an oyster where you have to know already what the pearl is going to look like. Right. Did you, now you've written novels before in English, before this. Did you try to write fiction first in Italian, then switch to English, or were you always thinking that you would write your fiction in English? Um, I lived for many years in East Africa, and um, um, that's the place where I actually thought of my first novel, which is called Rules of the Wild, which was set in East Africa. In, um, the characters were English speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to write it in Italian, and it didn't work, mm -hmm. because in my head I was translating their my thoughts and, the, and their dialogue into Italian, and it didn't sound right. So I abandoned the, the book, and I spoke to a friend, and I said, I can't do it. It doesn't work. And she said, it doesn't work because you're doing it in the wrong language. You have to try and do it in English. But I didn't feel entitled to do it, because you see, I didn't go to English school. Mm -hmm. So I felt like a fraud because I think you are entitled to speak another language properly only if you've studied in that language, which is probably wrong. Um, anyway, I had nothing to lose, so I said, okay, let me see how it works, you know, and uh, if it works, and he did, and it's instantly the language came, the, the, the pages came, and I realized that um, knowing a language properly is probably only 50%. It's what, it's the feeling that you have speaking that particular language that makes the writing, I think. So you can write with less tools as long as you have a reason to use that language. Mm -hmm. That's my experience, at least. And you write screenplays in Italian still. I write screenplays in Italian, mm -hmm. except now I am, um, I cannot write screenplays in English, and it doesn't seem that I can write fiction in Italian, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm sort of, I, I'm, I'm torn between these two worlds, but it's good. When you're writing fiction in English, do you have to be thinking in English? Do you need an extended yes. period of living in that language? Um, 
I've, I've written most of my fiction work away from home. Mm -hmm. I've always tried to be away and be surrounded by English. My brain then gets into the, the mood. Um, it's important to me. So I've lived in New York, um, mm -hmm. but before I, I started, I, I became a writer. I was here as a very young girl, and I grew up here in a way because I was here for all my 20s. So I, New York's really the place where I think I've become an adult. So I'm always excited to be back here. When you do speak pretty flawless English, and <laughs> I only hear the trace of an accent, and I'm not sure I would even know what the accent was because well. it's such good English. Speaking of, of that, uh, is it what happens when the book comes out in Italy? Does, do these books come out in Italy? Yeah, it's being translated right now, and I am revising the translation. It's honestly, it's quite a shock to be able to. And I'm saying this because uh, all, maybe not all of us know the languages, obviously, you know, in which our books are translated. It's, it's definitely a shock to see your work in another language because I think that um, it's not just a matter of words. It's, the, it's behind the language, there's a whole culture, there is a tone of voice, there is a, a there is, um, a, you know, a voice that belongs to that particular culture. So um, it's, it's almost, a, a, it's kind of a violent act to take that and translate it and put it into a different form. It's like a bonsai, you know, you're like forcing right. something. Well, most writers wouldn't know the, the language it was being translated into, so they wouldn't That's what have I that mean. Sense. Who knows what we sound like in Dutch or <laughs> Swedish, you know? So, but unfortunately, now for me, I am able to see what it looks like in Italian, and mm -hmm. it certainly is not the same book. Hmm. But what can we do? <laughs> the stories in the book are set in Various lots of different places. places. There's a restless feeling to it, almost, mm -hmm. of. And, and the characters, for most of them, they're not places they live. They're more no. places they're visiting. It's, uh, how, did you, how did you arrive at that? What, what inspired you to write stories that way? I wasn't aware that I was basically writing the same story over and over again in different places, which is really what it is. The theme, the red thread through the book, is very precise, but I was very, um, I was unaware of it. It's all, all the characters in the book are sort of in a place that it's not their own. They're, they are faced with a culture which they don't fully understand. They are in that state that mm -hmm. for me is ex extremely interesting of vulnerability. The state that we are in when we visit a country that uh, we're not familiar with. And that state of vulnerability for me is extremely interesting because we are scared, but at the same time, we're very open. Not always, but in general, we can be. And, um, and that, I think, is what I'm interested in. Um, so all the characters are on the verge of some type of transformation, of change. So if you want crisis, but not necessarily in a bad right. way, crisis in the, in the sense of the Greek word, you know, of change and transformation, which um, so for me, um, I wasn't aware that in each story I was actually nailing that. In, you you know, became aware of it after you had written a few I, of them. I said, mm -hmm. this, is, this book is about one thing, really. Although, you know, they, and it's, uh, but I think that, you know, writers do have a theme that they keep hmm. um, writing about in different forms. I like that. I think, I think it's actually quite wonderful that one can pursue an obsession and mask it in different stories, but it's always the same. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't think writers necessar necessarily know their themes until they write a bit, right? Yeah. Well, maybe this is why we do it, because it's sort of a self-therapy. We figure out things about ourselves <laughs> at the end of the line, I what, hope at least. What's your uh, process like? How do you decide, now I'm going to work on some fiction in English, or now I might work on a screenplay. Is there any, do you have to kind of 
make those decisions and keep I wish, them separate? No, it's all very disorganized, really, <laughs> because um, of course, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this a million times. Uh, it's such a cliche, but every time um, I feel like I don't even know how I did it, it's almost like someone else did it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how I wrote this book and if I can ever write another one. So every time it's like, okay, that's the end of my career. <laughs> no, it's, and, and, um, and so you sit and wait. And so I use um, my real job, let's put it that way. You know, I write scripts, which keeps me at the desk, but it's so different because in a way I know I'm aware that I'm writing a product. I'm writing with other people, uh, which is a relief after so many months of being by, on my own. And it's, uh, but it's so different because you are bouncing ideas with other people and it's easier in a way, but also you're not in control completely. But that keeps me, you know, keeps my writing like I'm going to the gym every day. But um, I don't, I can't really plan. Mm -hmm. And even now I'm in that state of who knows, we'll see what happens But next. once you get going on something, Then you're... I get pretty, I, if I, yeah, I work every day. Mm -hmm. I cannot do two things at a time, so I stop my other work and I will work on a book. This is, you know, and I try to work every morning early mm. and be with it, stay mm -hmm. with it. Cause I, I was never very good at doing two things at a time. Uh, do you think you're gonna continue to write short stories? Was this experience something that changed you as a writer? I think this was the book that I most enjoyed writing. It was a fantastic time that gave me a lot of joy. Uh, of course, the terrible thing about short stories is that you finish one short story is almost if you finish a novel, then you're like, you've got another blank page. So that kind of angst is repeated nine right. times, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, apart from that, because you have to recreate an entire world and other characters, and so you do the job very often. But I have to say, I, I've always read short stories and love them, and um, I, would, I would love to keep writing short stories. I know that some publishers are not, are, find it more difficult to no, would they, rather, or maybe would rather have novels. You know. No, no, no. They love short story they collections. Love <laughs> They've all changed their minds but since we started the story I prize. Think, I think that short stories are, I mean, for me, it was a discovery. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, also, as I said before, a, a, to me, a perfect form. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. felt like directing her to her seat. <laughs> um, our, our next reader is Elizabeth McCracken um, for Thunderstruck and Other Stories. When you read this book, it's hard to believe that this is her first collection in more than 20 years. The story seems to come so naturally to her. They're not only skillful, they're original, nuanced, funny, profound, and self-assured. Nearly all of them we encounter characters who must acclimate themselves to painful loss. Most somehow manage to maintain their senses of humor and absurdity. Loss strikes a blow, but the characters endure. I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth McCracken. I'm so happy to be here and a little nervous and beside myself to be here with Laurie and Francesca, whose work I just love. Um, I'm going to read the start of a story called Something Amazing. And my mother would want me to take the cough drop that's in my mouth. 
excuse me, so disgusting and yet <laughs> trying to not to get a coughing fit during this reading. Just west of Boston, just north of the turnpike, the ghost of Missy Goodbeak sleeps curled up against the cyclone fence at the dead end of Winter Terrace, dressed in a pair of ectoplasmic dungarees. That thumping noise is Missy bopping a plastic Halloween pumpkin on one knee. That flash of light in the corner of a dark porch is the moon off the glasses she wore to correct her lazy eye. Late at night, when you walk your dog and feel suddenly cold and then unsure of yourself and then loathed by the world, that's Missy Goodby too, hissing as she did when she was alive and six years old, I hate you. You stink, you smell, you baby. <laughs> the neighborhood kids remember Missy. She bit when she was angry and she pinched no matter what. They don't feel sorry for her ghost self. They remember the funeral they were forced to attend after she died, how her mother threw herself in the coffin, wailing, how they thought she was kidding and so laughed out loud and got shushed. The way the neighborhood kids tell the story the coffin was lowered into the ground, and Missy Goodby's grieving mother leapt down and then had to be yanked from the hole like a weed. Everybody always believes the better story eventually. Really, Joyce Goodby just thumped the coffin at the graveside service, spanked it, two little spanks. She knew that pleading would never budge her daughter, not because she was dead, but because she was stubborn. All her life, the more you pleaded with Missy, the more likely she was to do something to terrify you. Joyce Goodby spanked the coffin and walked away and listened for footsteps behind her. She walked all the way home where she took off her shoes, black pumps with worn stones of gray along the toes. Done with you, she told them. The soul is liquid and slow to evaporate, the body's a bucket and liable to slosh. Grieving, haunted, heartbroken, obsessed, your friends will tell you to cheer up. What they really mean is dry up. But it isn't a matter of will. Only time and light will do the job. Who wants to, anyhow? Best keep in the dark and nurse the damp. Cover the mirrors, keep the radio shut off. Avoid the newspaper, the television, the whole outdoors. Anywhere little girls congregate, though, the world is manufacturing them hand over fist, though there are now, it seems, more little girls living in the world than any other variety of human being. <laughs> or middle-aged men whose pants don't fit, or infant boys, or young women with wide, sympathetic, fretful foreheads. Whatever you have lost, there are more of, just not yours. Sneeze itch, gas for breath, seal the windows, replace the sheets, then the mattresses, pry the mercury from your teeth, buy appliances to scrub the air. Even then, the smell of the detergent from the sheets will fall into your nose. The chili your nice son cooks will visit you in the bedroom. The sweat from his clothes when he runs home from high school, the fog of his big yopping shoes, the awful smell of batteries loaded into a remote control, car exhaust, the plastic bristles on your toothbrush, the salt air smell of baking soda once you give up toothpaste. Make your house as safe and airtight as possible. Filter the air, boil the water, the rashes stay, the wheezing gets worse. What you are allergic to can walk through walls. The neighborhood kids don't remember what Joyce Goodby looked like back when she regularly drove down Winter Terrace. They've forgotten her curly black hair, her star and moon earrings, her velvet leggings. It's been five years. Now she's locked away. They know everything about her. She no longer cuts or colors her mercury hair, but instead twists it like a towel and pins it to her head. The paper face mask she wears over her nose and mouth makes her eyes look big. Her clothes are unbleached cotton and hemp. An invalid could eat them. She and her son, Jerry, used to look alike, a pair of freckled hardy people. Not anymore. Her freckles have starved from lack of light. Her eyebrows are thick, her eyelashes thin. She seems made of soap and steel wool. 
Something's wrong in the neighborhood, she tells her son. It gave Missy lymphoma, and now it's made her sick. Of course she's a witch. The older kids tell younger kids, and the kids who live on the street tell the kids around the corner. The Winter Terrace Witch, they call her, as though she's a 17th century legend. She eats children. She kills them. She killed her own daughter a million years ago. Some gangly kid, not even from the street, tells Santos and Johnny Mackers about the witch and the ghost. The Mackerses have just moved to Winter Terrace. Santos is nine years old, with curly hair and a strange accent, the result of nearly a decade of post-nasal drip. Johnny is as tough a five-year-old as ever was, a preschool monster Santos has created on the sly. Santos steals their father's cools and lights them for Johnny. He has taught Johnny all the swears he knows, taught him how to punch, all in hopes that their mother will love Johnny a little less and him a little more. It's not working. Already they're famous on the street where no one has ever seen Johnny Marcus's feet touch the ground. He rides his big wheel everywhere, up and down the street and into the attached garage. He rides it directly into the cyclone fence. You're a crazy motherfucker, Santos says. A crazy motherfucker. He doesn't like the word himself, but Johnny won't learn it otherwise. That's Ghostland by the fence, the gangly kid says from the other side. That's where all the ghosts get caught. That's why they call it a dead end. No, sir, says Santos. Yes, sir, says the kid. Dead girl ghost, plus there's a witch. He spits to be tough, but he hasn't practiced enough. He just drools, then walks away embarrassed. <laughs> Johnny Mackers is swarthy and black-haired and Italian looking like his mother. Santos has his father's Irish looks. He likes to shut Johnny into things. Already, he's investigated the locks of their new house. The attic, the basement, the mirror-fronted closet in their parents' room, every lock sounds different. Key, knob, hook and eye, deadbolt. He's glad to learn of a ghost to threaten Johnny with. The dead girl wants to kiss you. Here she comes. Puck her up. But the dead girl isn't interested, and Johnny Mackers knows that the neighborhood kids are lying when they say they see her. The dead girl doesn't watch as Santos stuffs Johnny into the front hall closet. The dead girl doesn't see the fingers at the bottom of the door or the foot that stomps on them. She doesn't see Mrs. Mackers open up the door an hour later saying, what are you doing in there for Pete's sake? The way you hide, it drives me nuts. Why don't you go ride your bike? Go on now. The dead girl doesn't sleep outside ever. Why would she? She is with her mother, who, as she cleans the kitchen, her eyesight so vigilant she can see individual motes of dust, a single bacterium scuttling along the countertop, can hear the mortar and pestle sound of a plastic wheel grinding along the grit of the gutter, a noise that should surely mean more than a grimy black-haired boy getting from one end of the street to another. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> uh, there's, I, I mentioned this in the introduction, but there's a real, there's a lot of loss, fair amount of death in the book. Is that a, a theme that emerged as you wrote the stories? I think it did, and, and it was one of those things that I wrote. The oldest story in the collection is, I think, 16 years old, and most of them are much newer. And when I read the collection as a whole, I really did think, this is a depressing <laughs> book. <laughs> sort of startled by how sad it was. Um, and it, I mean, it's, it's generally something mm -hmm. that I've written about, but was probably particularly on my mind while I was writing the stories. Well, they're funny also. Do, are you conscious of maybe throwing in some humor to, to balance the more somber themes? I, you know, I, I I don't know if I could write if somebody told me not to crack jokes. Mm -hmm. That my, the whole pleasure for me for writing is a million jokes. And even there have been times when I've written things that I've thought, this is so serious. There's not a joke anywhere. And then two years later, I read it, and I just see the reflexive joking. I can't <laughs> stop. But I also think that. All the work that means anything to me is both. Mm -hmm. 
Do you laugh a lot when you're writing, when you come up with something funny? It would be terrible to admit it, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a tough question, sorry. Uh, no, I mean, mostly, mo I would say mostly not. Um, uh, I love Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot, and one of the things that I like about Twitter is that all of those jokes that I ordinarily put into my work, and then my readers read this and go, yeah, ha ha, very funny. That's got nothing to do with what you're writing. I can put into Twitter. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and so to some extent, I'm not, I do feel like it's reflexive. I can't say that I have any kind of religious belief at all, but the extent to, to which I believe there is redemption in the world of sadness, it is black humor. Mm -hmm. And like I will always, that to me that that's in the, in the worst moments of my life, there is always a joke to be made and that that's a deep comfort to me. I mean like a really, a sincere comfort. It's not, it's not putting off feeling things. It's, it's part of, of sad things. Do you, are you, are these Twitter jokes, are these things that you've cut from stories and saved for Twitter? I haven't actually <laughs> done that, but every now and then there's a line that I would normally try to cram into a story right. so that one of my readers will say, yeah, that's funny. Um, and now yeah. I, like, I've cut out. It's very time-saving mm -hmm. for me because I can just put it on Twitter now. You can test it yeah. and see what kind of reaction you get. Although I, think, I don't think I've ever put anything on Twitter that I've then put into Brought into back into, yeah. into real writing. Yeah. I noticed as you were reading that there was a lot of uh, sensual detail, a lot of smell, sight, sound, feelings. Is that something that you consciously work into the story? Is that something that, that you make sure your work has? I, don't, I mean, I honestly don't know how conscious anything I do mm -hmm. is. It all seems sort of like, a blunder, an experiment, and w when it comes out right, I'm really delighted. But I do feel like, as a reader of fiction, what I'm always looking for, whether I'm reading very realistic fiction or extremely unrealistic fiction, is evidence that the world of the, of the story or novel exists. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm always aware when I'm writing that I, I want to put in evidence that this is a real world with, with all of the sensory details right. of the real world. This is your first collection in more than 20 years. What I'm old. brought you back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you started when you were about 12 or 13, right? Uh, what, what, was, uh, what brought you back to the, to the form? Now, it sounds like you were writing stories in some of those years. I was, but not much. I mean, I was one of those people, my, my First book was a collection of stories, and then I started writing novels, and, and I, I felt like I had sort of stretched my brain out and that I couldn't get it back into story shape. And then I wrote two novels, and then I had a really hard time writing novels, and I, I sort of took solace, in, and short stories are always to read. Or, I mean, my, my favorite writers are short, or largely short story writers. Um, and it took solace in writing them again when I was having a hard time finishing a novel to my satisfaction. Um, and then I sort of realized I was close to a collection, and so I wrote three or four pretty, no, let's be honest, I wrote about seven. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put three or four of them into the collection at the end. Oh, there were stories that you wrote that are not in this collection? Uh, yes. That have not appeared anywhere? There are a couple of the, that haven't appeared anywhere. Mm. There's at least one that I published in an anthology and, and in a magazine that was too close to another story that I was sentimental about, and I didn't want them fighting against each other in, right. in the collection. When is the experience of writing the story collection when you sit down to write, is it very different from when you're writing a novel? Yeah, and it's it's sort of hard to, I mean, one of the things when I started writing short stories, maybe I had, had four of them, and I, but I, when I thought, okay, I'm gonna write short stories for a while, the you can hold a short story 
in your head in a way that you can't write a novel. And the only way I can, the, the way I've, I've recently been thinking about it, I had a friend who years ago said, oh, the difference between a short story and a novel is a short story is a love affair and a novel is a long marriage. And I always thought, for me, it's the short story is a blow to the solar plexus and a novel is a lingering illness you might never get over. <laughs> um, uh, but, but recently, I've been thinking of them in terms of dioramas and historical reenactments. <laughs> and that one of the things that I love about short stories is that you really, like with a uh, diorama, you really have to think about how to force perspective and to make a world that makes sense to the viewer, you have to do ridiculous things. You have to cut moose in half and like have one duck and then a painting of a duck and have them make sense. Um, and I really, I, I love that sort of sense that even the most realistic short story is not at all realistic in that way in order to suggest life where as with a novel, and I, I love novels too, you get to put the whole moose in. <laughs> all the ducks, all the ducks can be stuffed, stuffed ducks. I feel this metaphor is suddenly <laughs> falling apart. Uh, I won't ask you any further about it then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. It, it seems like this first story, in a lot of respects, really introduces some of the, the this idea of, of loss and you know some of the other stories are like ghost stories also in a way how how do you put the collection in order how did you decide to put that one first I, I put that one first because it's the only one in which there's anything even suggestive of the supernatural and I did sort of feel like if it came later in the collection that people would sort of think, oh, there are ghosts all of a sudden. This is mm -hmm. the world of this collection is one that can have ghosts, um, and so I wanted it right at the f at the start. And also, I'm somehow sentimental about that story, and it felt like, I mean, I suppose I'm sentimental about all the stories, but that one f did feel like it was about the content of the collection, in a way that it made sense for it to be. The, the entryway into the other stories. One of the interesting things about the collection is that each story is very different. There really are no two that are similar to one another. It sounds like you made a decision to leave out two that might have been similar. But it's, uh, the shifts are very pronounced. Is that, are you, are you trying to do something different when you sit down to write another story than what you've done before? Is that something you're pushing yourself toward? I, I hope they're different. <laughs> Um, one of the, I mean, I am the world's most inefficient writer, and I write pages and pages. Anything that I write has so much that doesn't get into mm -hmm. a book. And with a novel, it's actually more complicated and painful, but with a short story, I can like look at a short story. This is how I've, I've made peace with the fact that I'm so inefficient, is that I've decided that it's like a really butch thing, and that I can <laughs> give up pages and I'm so tough. And with a short story collection, it's actually really nice. Not like I'm a failure, that didn't work, but like, hey, look at me. And there's something that I actually find weirdly invigorating about going, this short story, I wrote it, I'm gonna walk away from it. This is not making me sound psychologically healthy. Um, but but when, I, when I put together the book, I did want to sense that I mean, I do. I think there are similarities between the stories in content, but I didn't want two stories taking up the same emotional space mm -hmm. in the collection. What did you mean and when you said some of them were just bad? Also, <laughs> <laughs> some were just not that good. What, what did you mean when you said walk away from it? Do you mean it's finished? I'm not going to touch it anymore, or do you mean I'm I'm abandoning it? I wasn't quite sure. Um, I abandon a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of it is that I don't, the, the, one of the things that's a pleasure about writing short stories is I think all the stories in the collection, the first drafts, 
I knew they were okay when I was at the end of the first draft, mm -hmm. which is not an experience I've ever had with a novel. Um, and that there's a real pleasure in a short story. I'm like, I didn't get that right. And I think if I worked on it for a really long time, all that I would get is a pretty good short story. And there's something that's really nice about something. Oh, well, I don't want to, I don't want to write a pretty good short story. I want to write the best short story I can write at right. that moment. And you know when it's working or it isn't working, you know when a story's good? No. So, <laughs> no, I'm filled with doubt and uncertainty, and I am one of those writers who depends enormously on my readers. Mm -hmm. And I would give a story to somebody, and they were like, mm, I don't quite get this. I'm like, that's fine. I'm done with it. I hate the story <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, so, so you have readers. You have people that when you finish something, you, you test it maybe with them. Yes. That, and are they writers, all of them? or is My, you know, uh, I have friends who are writers. Paul Lisicki, who is a dear friend of mine in the audience, is one of my great readers. And Patchett is one of my great readers. My editors, Susan Campbell and Noah Eaker, are my readers. My agent, Henry Dunau, who I depend on a great deal. Um, and, I, and all of those people I know are quite good at going, eh. <laughs> So you can right. count on them to be honest and to tell you. Yes, what and I wouldn't like. ever count on one of them, not because they're not right, but because that's too much pressure to put on one one reader. But yeah, and my and my husband Edward Carey, who's also. Do you now? Do you serve that function for other writers? For these same writers, are you reading Paula Sicki stories and and Patchett's and so forth? Yeah, they so mean, it's, yeah, sometimes at least. And do you think you're, a, you think you're good at that, at giving them an evaluation of their work? I think I'm great at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is partially because I teach fiction, and the only way I feel like you can teach fiction is by being the best reader that you can be. Yeah. And like that's my my entire goal as a teacher of fiction is to read generously and rigorously and um, wanting the best for the work. Um, so I work, I work really hard to do that. Do you feel like teaching has made you a better writer because you do that, because you apply yourself to the student's work? I think it's made me generous. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always a hard balance um, just because I love my students and during the semester when I'm teaching and I'm trying to solve fictional problems, they're often my students' problems. Um, and so it's, it's a balance. But yeah, no, I think by and large, yes. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I'll move my cough prop to shake your hand. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'd, I'd hoped to memorize these, but I kind of fell in love with what I wrote, so now I have to read it out. And it, it's, they're not that great, but, but I like it. Um, our final author this evening is Lori Moore. Her latest collection, Bark, builds on what I believe is an essential body of work in the short story form. This collection, like all of her fiction, is marked by keen observation, the sharp intelligence of the characters, which sometimes cuts them, skillfully crafted prose, and Moore's trademark humor, which manages to be both laugh out loud funny and painfully real at the very same time. I'm pleased to introduce Lori Moore. I was, I was saying to Larry earlier that there's no railing here, which I think is not up to code, but I made it anyway. It's sort of intimidating to, it's very intimidating to read after Elizabeth. I've heard her read before, and so to come after her great work and her great rich voice makes me want to try to find her cough drop, <laughs> which I don't see. 
Where did, you, you never took it out? <laughs> you put it back in? <laughs> That's really disgusting. But, oh, well. Okay. Um, I'm going to read um, from a story called Subject to Search. It's, it's got two characters, two friends who are in Paris. Um, one man, one woman. If you're suicidal, Tom said slowly, and you don't actually kill yourself, you become known as Rye. By the way, he added, make sure I don't have one of those ostensibly green funerals where they put the unpreserved body on view on a giant heap of ice in someone's blazing sunny backyard. I want a church. Also, I have my music picked out. Okay, she said. Just plug my iPod into some speakers in the front of the chapel. Position to genius, she asked, a compliment forehanded. She thought they, they were so rare in life and even less often believed. He acknowledged it with a nod, respecting her effort. Oh, he said, shuffle will do. <laughs> her own iPod would be an embarrassment, forbidden Broadway, sting, French for dummies. She looked around at the cafe's brass rim tables and the waxy cane chairs. Then she looked back at Tom. He was in a state of pain and worry she had never seen him in before. Back in their once shared hometown through the years, first when he was married, then when she was married. They had looked for each other across rooms, hovered near each other at parties. For years they had done it, taught and electrified, each stealthily seeking the other out and then standing close, wine glasses in hand, spellbound by their own eagerly mustered small talk. She would study the superficially sleepy look his face would assume atop his still strapping figure, the lowered lids and wavy mouth, and emanating from behind it all his laser-like concentration on her. The more a lovely secret was real, the less you spoke of it. But as the secret came to Evanes, as soon as it threatened to go away on its own accord, the secret itself grew frantic and indiscreet as a way to hang on to its own fading life. Now they had gotten lucky at long last, and neither of them was married anymore. Though anything that was at long last and that had involved such miserable commotion was unlikely to be truly lucky. They had arranged this rendezvous in faraway France, and neither of them knew its meaning, for its meaning had not been determined out loud. Is this a date or independent contractors in semi-prearranged collision, he had asked just last night. And then spring rain had poured down upon them, shining the concrete, dripping off both their sunglasses, excuse me, dripping off both their eyeglasses, which they removed, and she had kissed him. A private car now pulled up at the curb. Good God, he said, that car came so fast. Keep eating. That comes first. Eat whatever you can. The car can wait. She could see he had no appetite, but was force feeding, pushing the food as if it were a job. Small bites of the lamb. People are indeed sheep, he said, now chewing. Stupid as sheep. Actually, with sheep, at least one of them is always smart, and the others just turn their brains off and follow. What's Maury doing now, they ask each other. Where is Maury going? Let's follow Maury. The flock is the organism, like the military, she said. He swallowed with some difficulty and at first did not say anything. Yeah, occasionally. Civ Mill has never worked properly as a unit. He pulled a bay leaf out of his couscous. Bay leaves are bullshit, he said, <laughs> flinging it down on his plate. What will you do with the rest of your time here, he asked, rounding up the remaining food with his fork, pushing it into small piles with rivulets and valleys. I'll find things, she said, but it will not be the same without you. He put his fork down and grabbed her hand, which put a knot in her chest. Remember, never drink alone, he said. I don't, she said. I usually drink with McNeil Lair. <laughs> 
She assumed he would call her when he got to D.C. He withdrew his hand and fumbled with his wallet, threw cash down on the table and grabbed his suitcase. They got up together and walked to his car. The blue beret driver got out and opened the door for him. Tom tossed the bag in the back and turned to, turned to her, about to say something, then changed his mind and just got in. When the door shut, he lowered his window. I don't know how to say this, he said, but, well, keep me in mind. How could I not, she said. That's something I don't ask, ma chère. She lowered her head and he pressed his lips to her cheek for a very long moment. May our paths cross again soon, she said, stepping back. And then, like a deaf person, she made a little gesture of a cross with the index fingers of each of her hands, but it came out like a werewolf ward-off sign. <laughs> inept even at sign language, a Freudian slip of the dumb. As the car began to roll away, she called out, have a good flight. <laughs> His head turned and bent toward her one last time. Hey, I've got all my liquids packed in my unchecked bag, he shouted, not without innuendo. She flung one palm quickly to her mouth to blow a kiss, but the car, but the car took a quick right down the Rue de Bac a kiss blown in all ways. But she could see him lift his hand quickly at the window like a karate chop that was also a salute as the car merged and disappeared into the fanning traffic. Years earlier, at a Christmas party of a mutual friend, their spouses both out on the wintry summer porch smoking, she had found herself next to him in the kitchen jiggling the open bottles of wine to see which one might not yet be empty. The day before, along with a photo of prize-winning gingerbread houses on display at the mall, he had sent her an email. I just took three Adderall and made all these for you. <laughs> In the next room, Bob Dylan was singing Gotta Serve Somebody. What is the thing you regret most in life, he asked her, standing close. There were perhaps a dozen empty bottles, and she and Tom methodically tipped every one of them upside down, held them up to the light, sometimes peering into them from underneath. Nothing but dead soldiers here, he murmured. I'd like to say optimistically that they were half full, not half empty, but these are just totally empty. Unless you have a life of great importance, she said, regrets are stupid crumpled up tickets to a circus that has already left town. His face went bright with amusement and drink. Then what happens to the town, he asked. She thought about this. Oh, there's a lot of weather, she said slowly. <laughs> it snows, it thunders, the sun comes out. People go to church and sit in the sanctuary, and sometimes they see escaped clowns sitting in the back pews with their white gloves still on. Escaped clowns, he asked. Escape, she said, sort of escaped. Come in from the cold, he inquired. Come in to sit next to each other, she said. He nodded with satisfaction. The past is for losers, baby. Kind of like that, she said. She wasn't sure that she agreed, but she understood the power of such a thought. His stance grew jaunty. He leaned in close to her, up against the kitchen counter's edge. Do you ever feel that no one knows what you're talking about? That everyone is just pretending except for me? She studied him carefully. Yes, I do, she said. I do. Ah, he replied, straightening his posture. He clasped her hand. Electricity burst into it, then vanished as he let go. We're all suckers for a happy ending. That's the end. Thank you. Is that right? Yes. OK. We can hear you. All right. OK. I don't think we You must be tired, Larry. No, no. <laughs> no. I'm pumped up to interview you. <laughs> okay. right. I don't think we got this part of the story, but there's a, a political aspect to it. Yes, this guy, this guy wore moonlights in military intelligence. I have a couple of friends who do that. You do? Oh, yeah. There's, 
There are a lot of people who do that. <laughs> um, and their lives are kind of complicated. But, um, yeah, so he does do that. But I, I couldn't read the whole story, so I just mm -hmm. did the... No, no, I'm just... Yeah. I'm going somewhere with this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and oh. I, won't, I won't ask you to name names because I don't want to put any of your friends in danger. Well, I don't think they're proper spooks. I think they just, I don't know. I don't know what the privacy rules are for them. Yeah. Where I was going was that okay. this, I think these stories are very much of a certain period and that there's political events like the, mm -hmm. the war in Afghanistan and, and just that whole period is, is a big part of it. Is that, is that something that just drove you through these stories? Was that something that you were very conscious of doing? Well, I've, d I've done it before. In mm -hmm. my last collection, I had the build-up to, um, to the first Persian Gulf War um, in the backdrop of a, of a story because it, because it was occurring. You know, I was mm -hmm. taking a road trip, and I saw these trucks that had just been manufactured and were about to go to the desert. You know, this was the first. This was the first Bush one, Persian mm -hmm. Gulf one point one, <laughs> um, and so this. You know, it's it's the way we live our lives. Right. You know, these these things. If you're looking around, are sort of occurring, especially, you know, in the United States. And um, so I didn't want to artificially leave things out. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to sort of be in the characters' lives in the natural way that they, they are in our lives when we have conversations with friends and you know, So think for you, about them. what's going on in the world is part of Absolutely. the reality of the characters' lives. Absolutely. It's not just... Absolutely. Especially that 10-year that period, or 15-year period, we'll say, 2000 mm. to 2015 or 14, 13, you know, 9-11, mm -hmm. the invasion of Iraq the election of Obama, those things are all registered here, right. as is the death of Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. That's important. And another thing that I've noticed in this book, and I don't, maybe you have done this before, but I haven't been aware of it, mm -hmm. is there are a couple of stories that take inspiration from other writers' work. Yeah. Is that, some, is that something? I haven't done that mm -hmm. quite the way I did it here. I mean, one story, is tracks a Nabokov story very, very closely. Right. And I'd never done that before. I was sort of inspired by what Nathan Englander had done with the Ray Carver story. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ray Carver w was tracking a Chekhov story. And I taught all three of those stories to my students at Vanderbilt. And it was really fun to see the Chekhov lines that Carver had just lifted and put into his story. And then the Carver lines that Englander put into history. It was all th a thrill to see mm -hmm. this all kind of running through. And so I thought, I wonder if I could, and somehow this Nabokov story was really suddenly set my hair on fire after I had been reading it for decades. And mm -hmm. suddenly it just had a different kind of meaning for me. And I thought, what if we tracked this, what if I tracked a story and made my own changes, but just also sort of created a kind of answer story or echo and I didn't know if I'd be sued or not. I, don't, I you know, I still haven't been sued. So, um, so that was new for me. Mm -hmm. There's another story that kind of takes a story called Wings that takes a plot point from a Henry James novel. But a lot of people have done that. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't track the novel very closely at all. But it just lifts its a story element. And obviously, you you want readers to be aware of this because you've pointed it out Yeah, yourself. I don't want to be accused of, of oh. just sneaking it in and not acknowledging right. it. So it's yeah. to make sure no one accuses you of right. So I, and also Right, and I also want to sort of, I do want to openly acknowledge those stories and those mm -hmm. writers and to, and to express my you know, admiration of them as I write in their shadow. Mm -hmm. you know. Did you find yourself going back and forth between what you were writing and the author's text, or did you just go on your memory of it and your, your knowledge Oh, the with the, the James, it was just a, a general plot element, mm -hmm. so I didn't follow very closely at all. The Nabokov is a very short story, yeah. so, so the one that I wrote tracks it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it departs from it, 
but then comes back and stitches itself back into the fabric yeah. of it. So I was, I was looking at it. Uh. it. It's interesting to read them together, and I did. Oh. I think that was, <laughs> and I, I like that uh, in your story, the woman offers someone a white Russian. Ah, thank <laughs> you for getting that joke. Not everybody <laughs> noticed that. <laughs> I laughed my head off at my desk. <laughs> the, woman, the woman offers her departing boyfriend a drink, and she says, would you like a white Russian? Which is, you know, a little Nabokov joke. Right, right. <laughs> Well, it took two, but, took two or three readings for me to get the joke. But really? I got it. Oh, but, but you're still the only person in America who got it. I, I, did anyone else get no, that? No, no. <laughs> Can't really see you. <laughs> uh, so. Speaking of, you know, you said you laughed aloud as when you wrote that. Do you? Because I'm do demented. Because Elizabeth's not demented. I'm just demented. Yeah, so I you can't laugh go. a lot when you write. Some, I laughed at that. I thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is funny. I mean, I laugh in a dry, dry way. <laughs> <laughs> is the humor something that comes out in the first draft as part of it, or is it yeah. something you add as you, no, as you work just, on the No, it's just part of the texture of life. It's just part of mm -hmm. how people are. Um, it's just part, it's part of human resilience. It's part of human survival. It's just how people, you know, talk to each other. Um, you Do know. I know. You know. Do you know, do you know the phrase, uh, l'esprit de scalier? Yes. Is that, that, that's the spirit of the staircase. Spirit that's of the staircase, saying right. or what, the mind of the staircase. It's what words. you think of after. Right, it's sometimes called right. a mot d'escalier, the words of the staircase, right. Right, so it's, it's what people think of what they wish they had said right. what they later wish they when they're on said. the stairs right. going down. Right. Does, is that part of what informs the stories? Do you think of things that you wished you'd said and then put them in? Well, no, I haven't lived these stories myself. Mm. The stories are compositions, and, and I mean, they may be drawing from some real life things, but the actual stories, I've never, there's a bug in here. <laughs> um, the actual stories aren't, aren't things that I have lived and therefore get to sort of, you know, reinsert dialogue So into. you don't write down a good line you have and then try and work it into a story you... Well, I may write down a line that, yeah, I might write down a line I hear or that mm -hmm. I come up with and then I think, does it, be, would this person say it? Would it, does it fit? And sometimes things are usable and sometimes they're not. But yeah, I, coll mm -hmm. I collect a lot of things through notes and, and things, yeah. What's, what is your process like? The sentences seem very, very carefully written, which is, I'm not saying the others weren't <laughs> careful, but uh, do, does it take a lot of work? Do you do a lot of rewriting and polishing things up? You know, right after college, I had a job as a paralegal. And I, it was before there were computers, and what I had to do was, con it was like working for Reader's Digest. I had to digest depositions, and I had to suck all the extraneous language out of the, these um, depositions. Mm -hmm. And so I became quite allergic to, to extra language. And I, start, I really started to even talk like tanto. Me, me go store, you know. <laughs> it was really, I mean, you don't, I, I took all the articles out, I took, I mean, so then I sort of slowed, then I went to graduate school and I was very careful about what I put back in. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still sort of slowly putting back in adverbs. I'm not afraid of adverbs anymore. <laughs> so. Do you, so, do you, uh, do you, what I was asking, but I don't, I don't know if there's any one answer. So does it take you a lot of time, or does that come naturally to you? Have you internalized that process? Yes, I've internalized down? that. And also, yeah, and I also teach for a living, so I'm crossing out extraneous language right. there, too. Um, but I, I think that's just part of, of short story writing, too. I mean, a short story has, has its own voice, but it also has limits, it has mm -hmm. t space and time limits, and you don't want to waste time with just sort of wandering off here and there, um, so. So you do, so you try to write it efficiently, but you also I might do. go back and pare, pare do. it down as you go. Right, and I might be a frustrated poet deep mm -hmm. in my heart, 
So You've never written poetry? Oh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I've never written any good poetry, we'll say that. Um, I did, I did write poems when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> Can you recite one? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, do you go back and forth between short story writing and novels? Is there a pattern you're, you know, you think, I did a collection, now I'll do a novel. It seems to be a pattern in, in right. your, your work. Right, right. And Beatty has that pattern. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems to be, to me, to be a natural thing that after you write a novel, you may have had some stories that you were working on right. during it. You may have a supply of stories, or you know, half a supply of stories, and you might want to return to writing stories. It is a natural sort of mm -hmm. rhythm to, for me to go back and forth. Is that a temptation um, that while you're in the middle of the novel, you got a good story idea to? Yes, you have to do that. Or you, I mean, yeah, I, I, I've done that with all. I've have I have three novels. My first novel, people say, oh, that's a novel. But yeah, I have three novels. <laughs> um, and during all of them, I wrote, I did write stories. So if you get a good, good story idea, if you feel yeah, a story, I will stop, you'll stop and, and write, right, write I the will, story. I will, yeah. And so the collection, does it build up over a fairly? So the collection builds up over. over a fairly long period of time. F fairly long, yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, well. Well, that's yeah. good. You're careful. It takes a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You're always, in a way, working on stories. You're always open to the possibility I'm of stories. I'm always open to the possibility of, of stories. I am. I am. I mean, it's probably not a good idea to have two things going on at your desk at the same mm -hmm. time. And it's good to concentrate on a novel and be in the world of, of that novel when you're working on it. But I have the habit of short story writing. I've written more short stories than I've written novels. So I, I know that sort of the feeling of, of story writing inspiration, the kind of energy and time it will take and the sh shape it will require. And, and I, so I'm familiar with that. Whereas it, so when I, can, when I feel the idea coming on, I, I will sometimes yeah, just stop and respond to it. A novel is really, really much different. A different process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All very right, much. thank you. Thank you. Let's let's hear it for all three authors again. I think they all read beautifully and had interesting things to say. Thank you. That was good. And that brings us to a difficult moment now. Uh, Julie Lindsay will come up and announce the winner of the Story Prize. Eleven years ago, when we hosted the first Story Prize, it was held at Symphony Space, and it was part of Selected Shorts. As exciting as it was to have actors read the stories, something very important was missing from the evening, the authors themselves. And that's why Larry and I brought the prize to this auditorium at the new school, to give the authors center stage, to have them read their stories, to hear them talk about what it means to write, how they write, why they write. That's why we all come here. So thank you to the New School's writing program for providing us our home these past 10 years. And thank you, Francesca, Elizabeth, and Lori for taking center stage. Your readings were wonderful. Your collections were selected as finalists by Larry and me out of a record 129 entries we received. In turn, they were submitted to this year's judges Noreen Tomasi, director of the Center for Fiction in New York, the award-winning short story writer Laura Vandenberg, and Arsene Kashkashian, 
book buyer and general manager of the Boulder Bookstore. Many thanks to them for the hard work of choosing a winner from these exceptional collections. Two of our finalists this evening will take home a prize check of $5,000 each. The winner will receive the grand prize of $20,000. Our congratulations goes to this year's winner, Elizabeth McCracken for Thunderstruck. Elizabeth, come up to accept the award. Have a beautiful bowl for you. Thank you so much. Beautiful book. And this is your check. Come say something. Go no, say something. Um, heavens, thank you so much. I, I, I couldn't love the work of the other finalists more. I want to thank the Story Prize and everybody I work with at Random House, Noah Eaker, Karen Fink, who's here, Susan Camel, my beloved agent, Henry Dunow, who's here, my family, especially my husband, um, Edward Carey, and, and two groups of religious zealots who mean a lot to all writers of short fiction, um, independent booksellers, who have not only, I know, pressed my book into the hands of a lot of readers, but have pressed other people's books into my hands, which means even more to me. Um, and also, uh, editors of literary magazines, uh, those who have published me, those who would want nothing to do with me, um, the, the idea that there are, there are people out there who are not only incredibly excited to find a home for uh, short fiction, but also will send you new short fiction, either through your computer or through the US Postal Service, um, is, is an amazing thing. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little beside myself. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, Thank you very much, guys.